Hi, I'm David Robertson, and we're going to look today at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. If you've got a Bible, look up chapter 5 from verse 8. On, uh, we'll go through possibly to verse uh, 20. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. I wonder what kind of society you would like to live in. Sometimes we don't think too much about society, but it's hugely important. Here in verses 8 and 9, we're looking at a corrupt society. The oppression of the poor, that comes from chapter 3, verse 16, and also chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Deuteronomy 24 says, Do not deprive the alien or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Well, here, there's a complex bureaucracy. Instead of being a system of checks and balances, it enables oppression and the denial of rights. Everything gets caught up in red tape. Does this sound familiar? Unless you have a good lawyer, money, power, you suffer. The powerless suffer. The top official, says Solomon, oppresses the next, who oppresses the other, all the way down until the bottom, the poor and the powerless. Though sometimes corruption goes all the way to the top. The king profits from the fields, we read at the end of verse 9. Perhaps it's being said that the king acts as an injustice. It's kind of a difficult translation here. But, which is what the government actually should do, because the government should act as a check upon injustice. It is better to have a government, even if it's corrupt, than not have a government at all. We need stable government. Go and read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. What do we look for in a political system? That justice and rights are not denied. But we shouldn't be surprised when that, that happens. Maybe we think we leave politics to the politicians and get on with making money. That will provide security. But it doesn't. Because that leads to the second description of society, the materialist consumer society. Verses 10 to 17. And a couple of myths here. Myth number one, money satisfies. The first problem with loving money is we never get enough to satisfy. Verse 11, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. There's always room for more. As your wealth increases, have you noticed, so do your bills. So do your friends as the prodigal son. Everyone wants to be friends with a lottery winner. The couple who start off on 10,000 pounds or dollars or euros or whatever it is per year suddenly find it difficult to live on 50,000 pounds or dollars or euros per year. One journalist in the Scotsman magazine recently said that it needs, one needs 150,000 pounds per annum to live an ordinary life in Edinburgh. Isaiah said it well. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. Paul said to Timothy just as well. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money does not satisfy. Myth number two, money solves every problem and brings security. It doesn't. You've got lots of money. You become a rich insomniac compared with the sleep of the poor laborer. That's what he's saying here. The rich cannot sleep well. The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. The rich work, but the laborer's physical exertion helps him sleep. There's a great evil here too. The wealth is hoarded and not used, and it can be taken away. Psalm 37 verse 16 says this, better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. It is a dreadful evil to have money and not being able to do anything with it. And in the light of the consumer society, we take nothing with us. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Look at this brilliant summary of verse 17. All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. They eat in darkness alone.
preoccupation with wealth leads to frustration. It leads to sickness. It leads to stress. It leads to strain. And then anger. Our plans are defeated and we get frustrated and angry. I think that describes our society. And I wonder if it describes us. But then verses 18 to 20 speak of the contented society. There is another life, equally outward, real, and observable. Matthew Henry, the old Puritan commentator, puts it this way. Nature is content with little, grace with less, but lust with nothing. Food and drink, the basics, the simple pleasures, companionship, joy, satisfaction, including religious celebration. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. Deuteronomy 14, 26. Do you know, let me say this to those of us in the Christian church. There is a simple philosophy of life that runs through both the Old and the New Testament, and that we should tie in with our worship, that people in our world will see a different lifestyle. It's not that we all go and become monks and nuns. It's not that we all have to live in communal houses, but we do live as a community. And one of the best ways for that to happen is to share food. I am a preacher in a church in Scotland and many people come to the church, they say, because they want to hear God's word. But just as many come and maybe many more stay because of another ministry that I'm involved in, but it's really my wife who's more involved. We work together as a couple and every Sunday, we have maybe a dozen people who come up and have a meal with us. After the morning service, they sit around our table. They're provided with lovely food and we sit and we talk and we talk about the word. We talk about what's been preached. We talk about different things. We talk about one another. We don't say this is the spiritual part and this is the non-spiritual part. It's all tied together. And you know, more is taught in those hours around our table, sitting at our fire before we go off to the evening service than they hear through the sermon. And I love preaching God's word. But when I'm sitting at the table and we're talking together, we're teaching and preaching and sharing with one another. The basics, the contented society. Satisfying work. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fear. And wealth and possessions, they too are the gift of God. I know what it is to be need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. If we have things, we are to be thankful for them. I love Wesley's motto, make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. J.D. Rockefeller, age 53, was then the world's only billionaire, earning $1 million per week. He was a sick man. You know what he lived on? crackers and wheat because he was so worried. When he started to give his money away, his life changed and his health improved dramatically. He actually lived to 98. I think that there's a kind of disadvantage here. If we are given things, then too often we are too busy to reflect upon our lives. And we do need to think and contemplate. If you are wealthy, and many people watching this will be relatively wealthy, including myself, We need to stop and to reflect and to contemplate what we have. Perhaps also we need to be just a little bit more positive. It says in verse 20, he seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. Perhaps being aware of the brevity of life, we so enjoy it that we're able to live and enjoy each day as it comes. The worldly man looks to money and business to preoccupy him. The Christian has a life of joy and faith to preoccupy either him or her. Secular life is a life of drudgery. Christian life is the opposite. We are to enjoy life. Now, let's be very careful here because a lot of Christians, because we bought into the compartmentalization theory, we tend to listen to something like that and say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go out to enjoy But actually to enjoy something is quite difficult if you don't have the center right. And the center has to be Christ. Matthew 6 verse 33 says this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom. See, I know a lot of Christians that what they do is 
They seek God's kingdom in order that they can get all of the things. But the trouble is that by doing that, by seeking that relationship, by seeking that money, by seeking that job, the trouble is that you're not seeking first the kingdom of God. Maybe I can, you will, you will forgive a personal illustration or example. When I uh, went to Dundee, I was in a highland village in the highlands of Scotland, if you've ever been there, a very beautiful area. And loved it. Walked out my front door, there was a golf course. Walked out my back door, there was a river. Looked out my study window, there was a mountain. Looked out another window, there was the sea. It was just gorgeously beautiful. And God had blessed us as a church. People were coming into the church. There was life. But we got called to a city called Dundee. We got called to a church that had fallen apart, that had a handful of people, seven people in it. And in my mind, there were things that I wanted to do. I liked football. I wanted to go and be a missionary in China. I wanted to study things academically. There's so many things that I wanted to do. And I thought, if we go to Dundee, I have to give up every single one of those ambitions because Dundee's gonna be a long project and none of those things I'm going to do in Dundee. And both myself and my wife, we knew that that's what God had called us to do and it's not a sacrifice. I hope this doesn't sound like some kind of melodramatic, you know, here's a superhero, done it all again. No, it's not, it's not a sacrifice to do what God wants you to do. It's the best thing possible. But we knew that's what he wanted. But nonetheless, there was still this conscious giving up. Well, do you know what happened? First person to become a Christian in Dundee was a Japanese lady, who then I got introduced to the Chinese Christian Fellowship. And instead of being a missionary in China, the Chinese Christian Fellowship now meets in our church. And we've met so many lovely Chinese people. The football? A young man, no, well, not a young man, a middle-aged man who was the director of the local Premier League football team started coming to church and I ended up becoming chaplain of that team. I got involved in the football. The academic? The University of Dundee doesn't teach theology. It has an evening class which was for Buddhism and Hinduism and so on. I went and said, why don't you have one for Christianity? They said, no one's interested. I said, try it out. They put an advert in the magazine. The class was oversubscribed several times. I got to teach theology at the university. Now you see what I'm trying to say. Everything I thought I was giving up, I wasn't giving up. God is able to provide us richly all things to enjoy. I think it's quite sad when those of you who are Christians, what you do is sometimes you hold back from God because you're waiting to see that he means it and that he proves himself. Do, do you see how stupid that is? And actually how blasphemous and how wrong it is because he's already proved himself in giving us Christ. And Romans 8 said, how will he also, having given us Jesus, not also along with him, freely give us all things? If you're not a Christian, and maybe if you are a Christian, you say this to your non-Christian friends, they'll find this a bit offensive. Uh, I'm recording this here in London, and on a radio program not too far from the street, I was sitting in a studio, and the president of the British Humanist Society, or some high office bearer, I can't remember exactly who, what his role was, he was very calm and measured until I said to him at one point, you're not a real humanist. And he was furious. I said, you've taken that. I said, real humanists are Christian humanists because we believe what's best for human beings. And he said, are you saying I can't be a full human being? And I said, absolutely. He was so angry. Well, this is where Maybe this will upset you. Being a non-Christian and trying to live life is like the person who goes to the best restaurants and has no taste buds. That's what it's like. You, you don't taste and see that God is good. You cannot experience the deeper and profounder joys of life. You will experience them to some degree, but not in their full capacity. Because having them without God makes them meaningless and futile. But for the Christian, it's not that these pleasures are taken away, it's that they are accentuated. It's that with Christ, they just become so much more real. I think that we will leave it there. But I ask you to look again at verse 20, where it says that the curse of having wealth and possessions 
is that we seldom reflect on the days of our life. Maybe we need to do a little bit more reflection and then we'd be able to appreciate even more the beauty and goodness of God. God bless you.